Thank you very much, Michael, for agreeing to give a build a cell seminar. And you can get started. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, so I want to discuss about the synthetic road towards ribosome biogenesis. But uh, I understood that uh, I should present myself first. So um, I'll take this uh, opportunity. Um, I uh, basically opened a new lab uh, less than a year ago at the, the Technion in, uh, in Haifa, that's the north of Israel. Uh, it's a very nice uh, city with uh, the sea, beach, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a nice uh, university, so um, uh, it's, a, it's really a nice uh, opportunity. Uh, it's a lab that focuses in biophysics and synthetic biology, and I take this opportunity uh, to advertise the new lab because I'm now uh, hiring. So if you are master, PhD, postdocs, and you are interested in what I'm going to talk about, uh, please drop an email. Okay, so that's it for the advertisement. Um, okay, the work that I'm going to present now is actually based on what I did during my postdoc at the Weizmann Institute in the lab of Professor Roy Barziv. So it's not what I did at the Technion, I'm doing it at the Technion. Um, so in the, in the field of uh, bottom-up uh, artificial cell assembly, uh, a field that I'm not going to introduce here, um, the, the, the ribosome biogenesis is a bottleneck, basically. Uh, a self-replicating artificial cell requires ribosomes. Ribosomes are really at the beginning of cellular growth and division, self-replication. Actually, the beginning of self-replication is not the cell that divides. It's really the ribosome making other ribosomes. So I... Uh, I, I present here uh, the, the macromolecule and its complexity. It's made of uh, two small, uh, two subunits. The small subunit, which is one uh, ribosomal RNA here in blue, the backbone, and 21 proteins. And the large subunit made of two ribosomal RNAs, this uh, red and uh, pink uh, spaghetti, and 33 ribosomal proteins. Uh, you see the, the, the complexity of the, of the machine. Uh, actually, in, uh, in E. coli, 10 to 20% of uh, proteins are ribosomal proteins, and 85% of the RNA in the cell is ribosomal RNA. So the cell invests a lot in, uh, in the ribosomes. Uh, it's, it's really a central, uh, central piece. And if you want to think about reconstituted systems, only thinking about reconstitution of gene expression and taking as a uh, basi uh, basis the pure system, which is like a, some, some sort of a minimal system for gene expression, uh, you, 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 you would need to, to get gene expression in this minimal system, 36 proteins, enzymes, uh, according to the, 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 the composition of the pure system, uh, plus ribosomes, meaning that if you think in terms of minimal genome, you would need these 36 genes for the enzymes and the genes for the ribosomes, meaning three RNA, 54 proteins, and 10 to 20 proteins to help ribosome assembly, meaning that you would need about 100 genes, two thirds would be related to ribosome biogenesis. So thinking about reconstitution, ribosome is also a, a major piece. So you see now the, the, the problem, actually. The ribosome is probably the most complex machine that is required for, uh, to build an artificial cell. So the question will be, can we reproduce ribosome biogenesis, but in a synthetic environment? The cell knows how to do that. Can we do it in a synthetic environment? This, this is a little bit too big for us. So we are going to, to focus on the small subunit. Uh, so we, are, we will try to reproduce the biogenesis of the small ribosomal subunit. We won't talk about the large subunit now. 
So here is our objective now. We want to reproduce ribosome biogenesis outside of a living cell. So in simple terms, what does it mean? It means that we want to take the genes that will code for all the pieces, the RNA and all the proteins. We want to add a cell-free gene expression reaction to express that. And we want spontaneously, autonomously to uh, make all the pieces through transcription and translation. We want these pieces to assemble uh, together to build uh, again spontaneously a new small subunit. We want old ribosomes to make new ribosomes or new small subunits of the ribosome. That's the objective. And, and the problem is that you need 20 basically, 20 binding events on the same object. So if you think about doing it in a dilute environment, in a, in a classical uh, test tube, in a reaction, dilute environment, it's not going to happen. You won't get 20 binding events on the same object. So what we need is actually we need two tricks that I'm going to, to, to present now. Two tricks to get it uh, uh, going. The first trick that I'm going to, to discuss is uh, the DNA brush. Instead of having the DNA molecules in a dilute environment, we concentrate all the DNA molecules on a surface. We bind them on a surface. Uh, the DNA brush is a very dense object. We can put about a thousand DNA molecules per micrometer squares. So inside of the DNA brush, you get the concentration of uh, the DNA that you get in the bacterial nucleoid. So it's biologically relevant. Uh, the, the idea, the rationale behind the, the, the DNA brush is that if you concentrate the, the, the DNA, you will also concentrate uh, uh, all, the, all the products. So you may get to high enough concentration to drive assembly. And it's also a way to reduce the overall DNA uh, amount that you, you, you require and, 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 and then keep the, the, the bulk as it's some kind of an infinite reservoir for, for nutri, uh, nutri, nutrients and, and energy. And, uh, so it's a, it's a way also to economize in, uh, in DNA. So just let me show you how, how we, uh, we can make a DNA brush. We basically spot uh, droplets of, uh, of uh, let's say, buffer containing DNA molecules. And the molecules will, uh, after some incubation, will bind to the by one end to the surface through biotin statability in the interaction, uh, uh, building this uh, DNA brush. So the, com the DNA composition of the droplet is actually the DNA composition that you will get in the, in the DNA brush. And the, the dimensions are about uh, uh, 50 to 100 micrometer uh, diameter here. These droplets, these are uh, uh, maybe 50 picoliters uh, droplets. And the height of the DNA brush is about 100 nanometer. Okay, so now we want to, to study our system. I told you that this DNA brush will maybe concentrate the gene expression locally. I need to prove that. So I need to study gene expression on a DNA brush. To do that, we will use turf microscopy. So turf microscopy is a, is, is a way to uh, look at surfaces, at, to look at what's going, what happens in the first 100 nanometers above the surface, which is the size of the, of the, the height of the DNA brush. So it's a, it's a, it's a relevant technique uh, in our case. What we are going to do to study gene expression is the, fo uh, the following. We will design different experiments labeling each time another actor of gene expression. So if we start with the RNA polymerase, we label the RNA polymerase and we see during gene expression, where does it go? And you see that it localizes uh, on the DNA brush. You, in the cartoon, the green is the labeled species. If now you label the, the, the RNA that you make through a, a broccoli aptamer, you see that the RNA 
the fluorescent signal of the newly made RNA also localized on the brush. So that's not a surprise. The RNA polymerase bind directly to the DNA, and the, the, the RNA that you make uh, uh, is, is made from the brush. So there is a physical connection between the brush and these and, and these uh, these uh, these uh, actors. Now, if you label the ribosomes, you see that the ribosomes also localize on the brush, and it's 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 uh, even more surprising that if you if you now build a DNA brush made of non-coding DNA, no genes, the ribosomes are excluded from the brush. The brush is so dense and the ribosomes are so big that they are excluded from the, from, from the, the, the DNA brush. So the fact that ribosomes localize on a coding DNA brush is, is the sign of biological activity, basically. And last, if you make a, a, a fluorescent protein from the brush, you see that the fluorescent signal also localized on the brush. So the DNA brush is really a source of a, a gene product. Now, we, we, I want to open a parenthesis to, to study a little bit more this uh, uh, idea of ribosome localization on the DNA brush to understand a little bit better our, our system. We have two scenarios uh, uh, to, to interpret this uh, result. Ribosomes could be surrounding the DNA brush in some kind of a cloud, uh, but without getting inside of the, of, the, of the brush, that would be what suggests this uh, result on non-coding DNA, that ribosomes are excluded from the brush, they cannot get in, or maybe biological activity can drive ribosomes inside of the DNA brush. So let's, let's see if we can figure it out. Are ribosomes engaged inside of the brush or organized around it? So to study that, we made three types of uh, brushes with the gene, a small gene, either on the top of the DNA, in the middle of the DNA, or at the bottom of the DNA. And we look at it in turf microscopy again. If the uh, ribosome can get inside of the brush, it will follow the gene, and then it will, it will be lower in this configuration than it is in that configuration. And when it's lower, it's gonna be more excited by the, 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 the wave of the, of, the, of the turf microscope. So basically it will give a brighter signal. If all the ribosomes are in a cloud outside, the signal should be the same. And actually what the result gives uh, the following, the situation with the, with the gene at the bottom gives the strongest signal, suggesting that ribosomes are able to get in. But that's not enough. It's not a proof because maybe all the ribosomes are again outside, but for some reason, configuration number three produce more mRNA, building a cloud in the surrounding of mRNA that is uh, more concentrated, driving more ribosomes than in this case, for some reason. We need to prove that uh, ribosomes are really driven inside of the brush. To do that, we, we performed FRAP experiments. So we bleach uh, uh, part of, uh, of uh, the ribosome that are on the, in the brush, and we look at the recovery of the, of the signal. And you see, again, in these uh, three configurations, and you see that the recovery on a non-coding uh, DNA is much faster than the recovery that you, you, you get in, let's say, configuration number three, where you have activity and when the gene is at the bottom. And you see that actually, the lower the gene, the smaller the diffusion coefficient of your, of your ribosome. You can actually extract from these FRAP recovery uh, curves diffusion coefficient. And in the case of free diffusing ribosomes or ribosomes on a non-coding DNA brush, you get a regular uh, diffusion coefficient. But this diffusion coefficient is reduced with activity. And the lower the gene, the smaller the diffusion. So basically, mobility is reduced by activity. This goes in favor of the following scenario where ribosomes are actually engaged inside of the brush, physically bound to the RNA that are uh, produced in the, in the, in the, in the brush. I, 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 that's the, the, the end of the, the, the parenthesis that I opened some time ago. If we, if we come back to our 
first uh, 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 topic that was this trick of concent concentrating the, the gene expression in the surrounding of the brush, we showed that the DNA brush is a local source of gene product. So, so that's trick number one. Now, trick number two to build a ribosome. If you want to build this uh, small subunit, you need to put in the, in the brush all the genes to make all the pieces. Now, the folding of the RNA and the binding of all the, all the proteins will take time. By that time, even if at the beginning, locally, you have a high local concentration, the pieces will diffuse away in a, in a region of low concentration. So you need somehow to keep the, 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 the components close to the brush, close to the source of product. To do that, we modify one of the proteins with an HA tag, which is a tag that will bind antibodies that are on the surface, that we put on the surface. By doing so, the, uh, the protein binds to the antibody and the full complex binds to the antibody close to the brush. Now the complex is not, uh, uh, is not complete at the beginning, but you trap it next to the source, next to the high local concentration, and that way it's gonna get completed. It's not gonna diffuse away. So that's the first reason why you want to trap the, 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 the complex that you build next to the brush to remain close to the source. The second reason is that by doing so, you can look at, uh, at the assembly through turf microscopy, which is a very sensitive technique. You look at uh, what's going on on the surface. And the third reason is that you, you have now a way to separate old ribosomes that are non-labeled in the bulk from new small subunits with, that are labeled and on the surface. So uh, that's, that's the, the, the second trick, trapping the assembly complex. Now, if we want to study a little bit this second trick, meaning study a little bit the trapping of the, of the product, we can do it on a simple one, one uh, dimensional uh, symmetry. We, we choose a, a, a line of brushes, again, for simplicity, and we, pro, we, we produce from this brush a fluorescent protein that has the HA tag. So that will directly bind to uh, uh, antibodies that are on the surface next to the brush. Now, just uh, an experimental uh, uh, addition to gain in sensitivity, we have a way to pattern antibodies. We have a way to put antibodies only on these bright hexagons. So the signal will be on hexagons. It gives a more sensitivity. Basically, if you see on your uh, microscope hexagons, it means a specific signal. It's not non-specific binding. So when you produce these fluorescent proteins that directly bind to the, to the, the antibody, uh, from a line of, uh, of brush, you see this, uh, this uh, uh, pattern that propagates. You can get uh, diffusion coefficients from, uh, from that. You can play with parameters. You can uh, play with the, the gene density of your brush, increasing the, the, the more gene you put, the brighter the signal, basically. Uh, and the faster the propagation, the, 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 the front of your signal moves, that's the velocity of the front, so of the order of a micron per second. So, so that's the simple, uh, let's say, uh, uh, study where you produce a fluorescent object that directly binds to the antibody. Now let's get to the, the second, let, let's add a layer of complexity, meaning that you have now two families of two lines of uh, brushes on one brush, one line of uh, brushes you make a, a ribosomal protein that has the HA tag, the little red, uh, red triangle. This protein will bind to the antibodies, but it's not fluorescent. The other line of brush makes the fluorescent ribosomal RNA. 
that will bind to the protein that is bound to the antibody, so that will end up on the surface too, giving a, a, a turf signal. So in this case, the protein will get to all the antibodies, and then the RNA slowly will, will get to the protein on the surface, and the, the signal propagates towards the, the, the protein brush. Interestingly, if you put a lot of genes making, the, making this uh, HA protein, then the protein will saturate the surface, the antibodies on the surface, and will create a cloud of proteins in the, in the, in the volume. Now, the, the, the ribosomal RNA, the fluorescent uh, uh, object, will bind in the volume on one of the of these uh, proteins and then cannot get to the surface because the surface is already occupied by uh, by another protein so it's going to it's going to bind on the other side where the concentration of uh, protein in the volume is low so the front will propagate on the other in the other way why is that useful and interesting for us it means that if we put too many ribosomal uh, proteins if we produce too many ribosomal proteins with the ha uh, tag we have a signal inhibition. So it's important to avoid this artifact uh, later on. Okay, so now we, we have the two tricks. We have the brush, which is the local source of gene product, and we have the trapping of the assembly complex. So we are now ready to think about biogenesis of the small subunit. So what you need to know now is the assembly map of the small ribosomal subunit. It's not, the assembly is well organized. Here is how it happens. This is the ribosomal RNA, okay? So that's the backbone of the small subunit. It's the big piece. All the proteins, they, they have numbers, all the proteins, they bind directly to the RNA, but with dependencies. Some proteins are called the primary ribosomal proteins. They bind directly to the ribos ribosomal RNA. They don't need anyone. Some other proteins called the secondary proteins requires at least uh, one of the primaries to get to the RNA. For example, 16 requires 4 and 20 to bind to the RNA. The prior binding of 4 and 20 to bind to the RNA. And you have also tertiary ribosomal proteins that require some of the secondaries and some of the primaries to get to the RNA. They all bind to the RNA, but some requires others. You have dependencies like that, okay. So now the game will be the following. The ribosomal RNA will be the labeled species. That's the only fluorescent object, the ribosomal RNA. The other proteins will be either uh, simple proteins or will be modified with the HA tag, meaning that they will be the species on the surface. When they are the species on the surface, the signal comes from the binding between the RNA and the, the specific HA protein. Okay, so now that we understand that, that let's de design the first simple experiment. In this simple experiment, you create uh, brushes where you have only two species. It's a two-body experiment. The RNA, you, the, the gene of making the, the, the fluorescent ribosomal RNA, that's the fluorescent species, and another protein with the HA tag. And because it's, it's, a, it's a DNA brush, it's on chip, you can scan all the proteins on one chip. So you scan all the proteins modified with an HA tag in this two-body configuration. And when you get a signal, it looks like that. And interestingly, because it's only a two-body uh, experiment, you only get a signal for primary uh, proteins. When the, 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 the protein with the HA tag is a primary protein. All the others give almost no signal 
because you don't have the other proteins that are required for to bind the ribosomal RNA. So that's kind of a healthy check that we don't get artifacts on, on our system. Only the primary pro proteins will bind the RNA in this case when uh, the other proteins are absent. So just to make it a little bit more visual, you can put all the experiments on this uh, on the map, and you see that only the the first line corresponding to the primary ribosomal proteins is lighting up. The others are are still dark. This is a a bubble. Okay. So now basically we we should jump. We had this experiment, this two body experiment, when we had only signal for primaries, nothing for secondary and tertiary proteins. Now we add all the other proteins in the surrounding. So we still scan, we still have 20 configurations where the, the ribosomal protein with the HA is different each time. But we put that in presence of all the others. And now we can bind all the proteins to the, to the ribosomal RNA because now everybody is present. So we, we everybody is, is a, uh, all the dependencies are, are respected, basically. And in this case, you can build a signal for, for all the proteins. And again, if we want to make it a little bit visual, you can see that now, not only the first line will light up, meaning you bind these proteins with the RNA, but also the, the, the secondary and the tertiary proteins are giving a signal. And interestingly, they don't light up at the same moment. The signal doesn't start at the same moment, if I, if I play it again, you, you will see that some are lighting up fast and then others, and then you have late ones, late binders. So if you plot the time, uh, all the times where the signal starts and you put them together, that's the beginning of the signal for each protein, you get the, the, the timeline of the, of the ribosomal assembly. You, you have the order of binding of all the different proteins, one after the other. And you see that in our case, you get a complete, bind, a complete assembly after a bit more than an hour. Now it's interesting to, 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 to note that in a, in a cell, it takes about three minutes. So it's still very, very different. Okay, so now we can play another game. We can play the game of systematic deletions of proteins to study interactions between, between proteins. What protein is required in order for another protein to bind the RNA? So let me, let me be a little bit uh, uh, clearer with, uh, with an example. We, we try to play this game in a systematic uh, manner. So that's this slide, but I'm gonna take just one example here to, to, to explain, to, to make my point. If you take the protein number six uh, and you modify it with the HA type. So six is the protein that is anchored on the surface on the antibody. And if you get a signal, it means that the ribosomal RNA binds to the, the protein number six. Now the question is, and in the, in the, I don't know if you see it on the map, but you see six is one of the secondary, so it, it would require, let's say, 15. That's the meaning of this, uh, of this arrow, in order for the RNA to bind six. Now you put the, 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 the system in presence of other relevant proteins. Do the experiment and you get a signal. Now you remove 11, okay? White box mean uh, protein is not there, absent. You remove 11, you still get a signal. You remove eight, you still get a signal. You remove eight and 11, you get a signal. But you remove 15, you kill the signal. Meaning that you need 15 in order uh, to get the RNA to bind, uh, bind to, to, to six, basically. You can play this game in a systematic way and you get all the dependencies <clears throat> from, the, from the map. Okay, the last experiment that I would like to discuss here is the following. We, we tried to, 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 to study 
uh, activity of the small subunit that we that we just uh, made. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's not a simple question because you have um, you have the old ribosomes, so with the, the old uh, small subunit and the new small subunit. So when you study activity, it's not easy to 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 know what uh, what act, uh, who produces what basically, if the activity would come from the new or from the old. So what we did, what we did is, is the following. We again put in the brushes all the genes, making all the components, but now there is no tag. Okay, the, 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 the HA tag is absent from all the, all the proteins. What uh, binds on, on the antibodies are purified large subunits. So on the on the antibodies now you have large subunits of uh, of uh, the ribosome, and what we are looking at now is the binding of the newly made small subunit, which is fluorescent, the only fluorescent object, on these purified large subunits. Now, when you put all the proteins, you get a signal meaning you get a binding of the newly made small subunit on the last subunit. If you remove only three proteins, 13, 14, 19, that are known to be involved in the, in the, in the connection between the two uh, uh, subunits, you reduce your signal. If you remove all the primary binders, you, remove the, you reduce the signal, and if you remove all the proteins, you, you basically you don't have any, any signal. So it means that you have some specific uh, specificity in the binding between the newly made small subunit and the large subunit. So that's how, how far we could, we could go in terms of, uh, of uh, checking activity. So uh, this work opened uh, new directions that are now uh, uh, continued in the, in the lab of uh, Rui Barzil. Um, so uh, comparative dynamics of uh, small subunit assembly from different organisms. So we can compare the, 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 the assembly process of, let's say, E. coli, or, 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 or all the, the, the data that I presented were based on E. coli uh, genes. Uh, we can compare that uh, with other species. We work uh, now on, uh, on uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Now, when you have genes from different species, you can think about making hybrid ribosomes and see, uh, maybe using uh, the ribosomal RNA of one species and the protein of another. We, we, we are now thinking uh, of building a chip that would be more high throughput, uh, where the reactions would be would, would occur in compartments uh, and, and use that to screen uh, for new anti antibiotics, because many anti anti antibiotics are targeting ribosomes. So we can think about small molecules that would target ribosome assembly. And obviously, we are not trying, you know, we are not trying to assemble the large subunit. To build the full ribosomes, and there are many many challenges uh, uh, in in this uh, direction. So uh, with that, I, I would like to of course uh, thank uh, uh, the Barziv Lab, especially uh, Roy uh, and and Shirley that uh, helped a lot, uh, obviously in this uh, project, and that are still uh, helping uh, me to start my new my new lab. And uh, and I would like to to thank you for uh, your attention and. If you have any questions, I would be happy to, to try to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. There is um, a lot of questions in chat. Can you see chat? Uh, let me see. Yes. If you could read a question out loud before answering it, that's going to work for people watching the recording. Okay. Uh, wait, but there, I see things that are not related. <laughs> Competition, congrats on starting a new lab. Ah, thank you very much. So, BH says, con congrats on starting a new lab. <laughs> thank you, BH. Okay, TS says, it is a great UNIV with beautiful nature and science. I visited it. Okay, so thank you. That's about the Technion. So thank you, TS. Again, TS. 
Ah, so that's Taisio. Great and ambitious project. I love it. I have been wondering for many years how to plus protein appears without ribosome. This is another chicken or egg. Without ribosome peptides can be formed, but well, what would be the minimal size of ribosome to make some proteins with some error? How did the first ribosome appear without ribosome? Ah, that's the chicken and egg uh, question. Uh, that's an origin of life uh, type of. Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, 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 the active part of the ribosome is the RNA, actually. So uh, probably uh, things started uh, at the level of the RNA of the of the. Of the ribosome and proteins came to to stabilize the the, the folding of the of the of the RNA, but um, how how did the, the first uh, RNA manage to 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 get the first uh, uh, peptide bound? I, I um, it's it's a it's a it's a full uh, field of research, and I it's, I'm not an expert in uh, in this field at all, so so I I don't really know. Would this ribosome assembly method be in any way specific to the bacterial ribosomes, or could you do it with, for example, yeast or malian uh, TXTL? Um, so the, the challenges in ribosome uh, assembly, and I, I did not actually mention that uh, too, much, too much in, my, in, in, in this talk, uh, Challenges are um, uh, all the all the factors, the cofactors that are helping uh, folding and assembly, and not all of them are known. So we got lucky that for the E. coli small subunit, basically they are they are known. For the large subunit uh, of uh, the E. coli ribosome, they are not fully known. And I would guess that for uh, even more complex uh, uh, organisms like yeast or mammalian cells, uh, the, 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 the factors are not fully known. Uh, and they make uh, a huge difference. So it's not enough. And I, I did not mention that uh, actually uh, enough in, in, in this talk. I apologize. It's not enough to, to get only the proteins, you also need the factors to help the assembly. Uh, they are required and, uh, and they can be a, a bottleneck uh, to expand the, the, the process to other species. You need to know who they are. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you are just playing with genes, so yeah. What would happen if you use the ribosome with tethered subunits? Could you immobilize both subunits together on the brush then? So it's a very good idea that we had. Um, so it's 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 a way. It's probably a, a good way to 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 try to build um, <clears throat> a full full um, functional ribosome because then you don't need to to get the two subunits to, to, to get together. Uh, but, but you need to build the last subunit for, for that. And, and that's the first, uh, the first step. And, and we are not there yet. But it's a, it's a very good idea. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, if, if we can build the last subunit, it should, uh, it should work. And fortunately, I have to leave the meeting already. Thank you for this very inspiring presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. Fantastic talk. Could you use it for assembly of other enzymes? Yes, and actually it was done um, for um, uh, viruses. Uh, beautiful work. Can you please comment on the surface chemistry immobilization strategy? Thank you that you use in the. Pro okay, so. Um, Regarding the, the immobilization of the DNA and of the antibodies, so 
we use um, a molecule <coughs> that was developed by the by by the lab of uh, Rui Barzil. Um, it's it's based on a peg molecule that is covalently bound to the to the to silicon oxide, so to glass, and it builds a monolayer on the top of the the glass, uh, and it has a function that is UV sensitive. Uh, so you basically, have a monolayer with a function, an amine function that is UV sensitive. When you illuminate it with UV. You break the protection and you um, release uh, uh, this amine function that is now accessible. And basically, it becomes uh, a glue for DNA, basically, wherever you put the, 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 the UV um, uh, light. Uh, so you, you can combine, basically, the binding of, uh, of uh, molecules like DNA or antibodies or whatever you want with UV lithography. And the, the, the basic chemistry is this uh, PEG uh, molecule that is on one hand bound to the silicon oxide that branch out to, to, to build a monolayer with, uh, on the surface. And on the other hand, that has this amine function that is protected um, uh, and that gets deprotected with, uh, with UV. So through little, that's how we can get this, uh, hexagon, uh, this hexagonal pattern. Uh, we basically illuminate, uh, put the UVs on the hexagons. Okay, so where were? Okay, thanks. tRNA, ribosomal RNA, with random collision, might be able to synthesize the first ribosome based protein, although some peptides would be formed without ribosome. Thanks for the answer to the challenging question. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Would it be possible to use something else to immobilize ribosome like surface of a liposome instead of peg brush? Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, super cool work. I don't have questions. I just wanted to say this is <laughs> okay. Well, thank thank you very much, AB. Okay, so. I think, yeah, I, I, think I looked you went, at everything. Yeah. I think you went through all the questions. Um, I had my own question that someone already asked about it. Um, I'm really interesting, interested about the whole ribosome assembly. So like stuff you talked about, the tethered subunit and such, but I can see how that's going to be super challenging. Um, yeah. And I'm, I really liked what Faisal was talking about. I think this system would help us investigate some of the origins like systems like there's this work from um who was it i think it was mike yaros's lab where they published the minimal peptide catalyst um and the minimal ribosome ribosome kind of model and i think that would be super cool if that something like that could be done using your single molecule immobilization system to kind of trace that molecule by molecule yeah, Kate, that is exactly what I thought. And then this is a super cool system. I wanted to see something, some answer to the very challenging question. Uh, I thinking about for many years why I couldn't find the solution or answer up until now. But your system will potentially answer the question, I guess. Hopefully. I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, it is actually. Uh, possible, and it was done in the, in the Barziv lab, to get to the limit of a single molecule, uh, to get to the single molecule limit in this system. Um, it was done by a um, uh, uh, postdoc uh, called um, Cardinal. Um, so, so we can definitely get to, the, to this uh, single molecule limit on the, on the system. But then we yeah, basically combining genes and, and uh, self-free gene expression to, to get whatever you want to make. It can be origin of life or something else. Yeah. All right, if there are no other questions, I want to say thank you again, Michael, and thanks everyone. 
and have a great rest of your Monday. Yeah, well, okay. thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Michael. Kate, I have one quick question about workshop. Let me, oh yeah. Uh, yep, go ahead. So, so you kind of already kind of, you know, schedule things or, you know, still kind of you are working on those